Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Glory be to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of all ages, amen. We started a very short series last week talking about the outflow of grace. Um, and we were introducing the concept um, that everything that has an inflow has to have an outflow. Otherwise, there will be congestion. Oh, like a case in point, the Toronto, the roads in Toronto, there's all these cars coming in, but they've got nowhere to go, right? And what happens is that, is that everything gets stalled, everything gets stunted. Um, before we used to have an usher, we didn't always have an usher for communion. I gave this example last week. Once all the aisles are filled with human beings all around, like everything stops. Unless every move, everybody moves at exactly the same speed, right, then it, then, then it stops. Um, it, you'd think it would still work, but like if, if the, the aisles are full of people um, and you're over here and you just received the body and the blood, supposed to two priests, and you want to get to your seat over there, right, you, you can't because the aisles are all full of people. There's no outflow. And so the solution that we've done to that is to try to time people coming out of the pews. But this is true for any concept in life. Um, if your inbox has, has so much inflow and you have nowhere to send the work, you have to do all the work yourself, right? Then what's gonna happen? More work is gonna pile up in your inbox because, you know, the bottleneck, um, the bottleneck is here. If you have, you know, a team of 14 people who work for you and you can get this file to this person and this file to that person, this, then there can be more work coming in and you can because there's an outflow it's the same in spiritual life and i was sharing briefly last week just for for everyone who's joining us this week as well that the inflow of our spiritual life is in general is our our worship of god <clears throat> the opportunities we have to worship god is our opportunity to learn when you when when you read when you study when you hear a sermon and so on Right and fellowship. When you have that 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 healthy Christ-centered, explicitly Christ-centered gathering um, um, that edifies you, where where iron sharpens iron. Right, <clears throat> those tend to be the inflows of into our spiritual life that feed us, that build us up. Um, and every Christian needs some form of uh, of that in some way, and it's the role of the church to try to help people to find true worship, true learning, true discipleship, and true fellowship. But then, you know, where all this is going to go, right? Last week, we talked about sharing the good news with other people. Today, we want to talk about service as an outflow. There has to be an outflow of all of this goodness. There has to be an outflow of all of this goodness. I tell you the truth. The truth, when I sit and I read my Bible diligently, daily, on a daily basis, I can't help, I, I find myself unable to resist sharing that with other people in sensitive and, and thoughtful, emotionally intelligent ways. I meet people all the time that are so full of the Word of God that it just overflows, it just spills over out of them. That's what we talked about last week a little bit. This week, I want to talk about something else. I was uh, had the opportunity to visit St. Paul's Monastery on the Red Sea. Some of you might have been there. Um, and um, I was uh, waiting for one of the older monks, uh, who's a, a saint. So one of the younger monks was sitting with me. He was sitting with all of us, like the group, but I was sitting next to him. I told him... Uh, uh, Kabuna, every, every monastery has a character, has a flavor. What's the character of the monastery of St. Paul? And I was expecting him to say, this is an intentionally very ancient and archaic monastery. We've rejected most forms of technology um, as an institution, and most of the monks as well choose not to have a cell phone, choose not to have any kind of electronics in their cell, choose to live them without electricity, many of them without running water, many of them without gas, um, and, they, and they choose to live this very primitive life, um, and, and, and they find that that, you know, um, 
uh, is conducive to their spirituality. Up the road, not too far away, St. Anthony's Monastery has all the latest technology and has all the latest everything, and then St. Paul's Monastery is different. Not that one is better, one is worse. That's what I was expecting him to say, because this is known about St. Saint Paul's Monastery. You know what he said to me? He said to me, Amba Daniel is our abbot. And Amba Daniel constantly tells us, spend so much time with God that you become like a bucket, which is so full uh, with the love of God that it spills over everywhere. You know, you ever made a cup of tea? He says to me, Ab Abuna, you ever made a cup of tea? I told him, I don't drink tea, I drink coffee. He goes, that's okay, we forgive you. You know, but I told him, but I make a cup of tea for my wife. I said, yeah. He goes, do you ever fill it right to the top? I said, unfortunately, yes. He goes, what happened? I told him, it spills over everywhere. He goes, yes, with a cup of tea, you should refrain from doing that. But our abbot is telling us he wants us to be like that cup of tea that's over full, that inadvertently, without intention, spills over what? Love. Everywhere. Bidalla mahabba. You know? And the abbot will, le will lean over to you if he's walking by you in the, in, in the, in the, in the monastery, or what, lean over to you and he'll tell you, Abuna, are you spilling over? Right? And ask you, Abuna, are you spilling over? Are you spilling over what? Love. Service is love in deed, in action. You know, many times in the epistles it tells us, do not be hearers of the word only, but doers of the word. Right? To do the word that we heard, to do what? What a very specific word. To love your neighbor as yourself. That's the commandment in Deuteronomy. And Jesus, Jesus upped it for us. And he said, love one another as I have loved you. But for me to sit in my cozy armchair, thinking beautiful, warm, cozy thoughts of you, as you're going through the worst time in your life, and... But I'm sitting here cozy with a nice throw and thinking warm, cozy thoughts of you and, and feeling so much empathy for you. That is not, that is not the love we're talking about. What the love we're talking about is a love which rolls up its sleeves and gets right in there with people. That loves people indeed, right? In whatever measure or capacity you're able to do it. Mother Teresa says the same thing. Service is love in action. Bishop Yohannes of Garbeya, who wrote this beautiful, beautiful book called Paradise of the Spirit, and it's divided into various different volumes, and there's a volume on service. The first sentence is, service is love indeed. So, service is love. That's all it is. That's all it is. It's because I love somebody that I go out and I do, that I welcome them in and I do, that I wash their feet, that I cook them a meal, that I give them a ride, that I stay up on the phone with them, that I help them move, that it's out of love, not out of guilt, not out of um, uh, a desire for reward, not out of whatever other motivations could, that, that, could, that could drive us. It's simply out of love. And the source of this love has to be, has to come from a Christian perspective, has to come from God. Because I don't have, in my small little crusty old heart, I don't have enough love for all the needs of this world. Heck, I don't have enough love for the needs of my family. I don't have enough love even for myself, right? So where am I going to get enough love? Where am I going to get enough love to care for the needs of, of all of the people that God puts in my way. The only place, you know, the only place that, that it can is if there's it can come from is from God. There needs to be an inflow and there needs to be an outflow. And the outflow of grace, of this grace, this gift, this free gift of love, can be in the service to others. Now, I, like all of you, you know, sometimes. You like I know to do good, and I just kind of don't do it. So I was asking myself, why? Why do I sometimes just kind of don't do it? Well, sometimes I just kind of don't feel like it. So we'll talk about that. But more often than not, it's because I feel that I can't. I feel that I look at my resources, 
and I look at the need and think to myself, I can't meet the need with the resources that I have. I don't have the time. I don't have the effort. I don't have the energy. I don't have, forgive me, the heart. Like, I want to hear about this issue. People come knocking at our door all the time asking for money, right? For, like, charity, you know, like, uh, like, like not... Um, like, like in, you know, institutions, Plan International, this, that, whatever, Daily Bread, you know, and, and like, you know, I want to care about what, what you're telling me, but like, I don't, you know, um, and, but I do, like in my heart, I wish I could, like, but I don't, like, I, I care about doing my homework with my daughter, I care about cooking dinner for my family, I care about like, uh, like, I'm just so sorry, like, I, I don't, I could, I could probably spare the three minutes so they could tell me their spiel. Um, you know, and I could fill out the form and, you, you know, donate something. But I've, I've got so many other things occupying my heart that I don't necessarily care. So I'm going to limit my conversation with you to maybe those three things. You know what I mean? Sometimes we just don't want to. Sometimes um, we don't feel like we have the resources. Um, and and the, the most important resource is the ability to care. Um, what do I do? I feel like I just don't want to. Being the Feast of the Cross, I couldn't help but, can't help but bring, uh, tie the themes together, right? And it's going to be my answer for all three of those things. Find yourself an icon of Jesus on the cross. Find yourself a passage in scripture about the cross. Find yourself a bit, you know, a 15 second clip from the Passion of the Christ. Find yourself Find the cross, some way of bringing yourself before the cross of Christ and put it before him. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily have the nerve to kneel before the cross of Christ as he is trying eating on my behalf and tell him, I just don't really want to, you know? Right? And so that helps me to overcome my, I just don't really want to, you know? I have the time, I have the effort, I have the energy. I'm just feeling kind of lazy today. I don't really want to, right? So I don't really want to. When I put it before the cross of Christ, I see how foolish, how foolish it is, you know? Another thought which helps me a lot is the idea that time is very limited commodity you know we're not going to live forever and this life by the way it's not a dress rehearsal this is it this is your only sunday september 29th 2024 there isn't another one this isn't a practice run this is the one this is it right and before I know it, I'm going to be standing before not the cross of Christ. Yes, actually the cross of Christ, but in another form, the throne of Christ on judgment day. Not for God to punish me, for, for God to reward me. And I'm going to be holding before him the offering of my life. And what's going to be in the offering of my life? You know, if you look carefully in the Gospels, you'll find that a lot of the times that it says, shall by no means enter the kingdom of heaven, when in the Gospel specifically, not the Pauline epistles, it's almost always a sin of omission. It's not usually something that somebody did. Oh, he was a thief. He can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Case in point, the thief on the right was the first to enter the kingdom of heaven, right? It's usually what somebody didn't do, did not put on a wedding garment, did not use the talent that was given her, did not have oil in their, in, in, in their lamps. It's usually a sin of omission. I was hungry and you did not feed me. I was thirsty and you did not give me to drink. And if I have opportunity today to do something, I should take it. I should take the bull by the horns. The ROI is over... A, is over what is it? A hundred times a hundred. Over 10,000 percent. A hundredfold here on earth and in the kingdom. Can you afford, can you afford to pass that up? The gospel that was read today is the gospel of the cost of discipleship. Multitudes are following Jesus. And Jesus tells them, if you want to follow me, count the cost. 
Nobody goes and starts building a tower before he counts how much money he has, see if he has enough to build it. Otherwise, he'll get halfway through and he won't finish and everybody will laugh at him. Nobody goes to war unless he counts and sees how, many, how big his army is and then he can go to war, right? A lot of the time this gospel is in, interpreted, hey, it's not easy to, Jesus is saying, it's not easy to follow me. Count the cost and see whether you, you get to see it through because the, you know, the road is narrow and it's really tough. That is an, a, a true interpretation of this gospel. But I think humbly, forgive me, because this is the interpretation of some of the saints, I think for an our day and age, there is a truer interpretation of the gospel, of this particular gospel. It's count the opportunity cost. Can you afford not to follow Jesus today? Can you afford, if you have the opportunity to serve today, can you afford to pass it up? Can you afford to pass up an investment with a hundredfold, a hundredfold in this life and the one to come return? Can you afford to pass it up? These are the things I say to myself when I just don't feel like it, right? The cross of Christ the cross of Christ, and that moment on Judgment Day. What am I going to bring? What am I going to bring before me? St. Peter's mission in Scarborough is named after St. Peter, the worshiper whose icon is over here, right? And uh, he, he was a wicked, wicked man, <clears throat> and did, 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 was very greedy, didn't love anybody other than himself, and he was walking in the market one day with the servants, and a poor man came begging after him, wouldn't leave him alone. So he found an old loaf of crusty bread and he took it and he whacked the poor man with it and he said take this and get out of my face that night he had a dream that his soul was taken from his body and he was standing before the throne of god and the lord jesus christ was saying to the angels bring forth the good works of peter that we might celebrate him and the angels were scurrying about like mice trying to find something and one, his guardian angel found the old loaf of crusty bread and said, Lord, once upon a time he gave this to a poor man. And the Lord rewarded him for the crusty old piece of bread that he gave to the poor man. He woke up in a sweat. He woke up in a sweat and realized he has to change his life. So he started to collect, get the poor to come to his, to come to his, his house and he would give them whatever they need until his funds started to run low. So he started to sell off assets. He started to set his slaves free. Finally, he ran out of everything. He sold his property. He sold, he became homeless and he went to go and work as a servant in another master's house that he might have money from his salary to give to the poor. Finally, he felt even then he hadn't done enough. He had not yet given enough. The guy gave away all his money, sold his property, becoming homeless, then became a servant in another man's household so that he would have somewhere to live so that he could make money so he could give it to the poor. And he felt he still hadn't done enough. So he sold himself as a slave to his master and gave the money to the poor. That's why in the icon, he has chains. And he served his master so well that after several years, his master released him and he went to the desert and he completed the rest of his life in, in worship. These are extreme examples of generosity. These are ideals that we set before us. You're not a wicked person if you don't go and sell yourself as a slave. We're not promoting human trafficking. But the concept is, is that have I done when, 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 when the thought comes to me that I've done enough, the church is giving us examples. Can I look at the cross of Christ and say, Jesus, I've done enough. No, of course not. Ridiculous, right? When I look at the lives of the saints, they loved Christ. They loved him to the point that they wanted always to do more. These, these stories convict me, right? And what convicts me even more, if I can be honest with you, and I mentioned it during the liturgy, is your lives, is the lives of the people around me. I see other people around me that are under all the same pressures as me, right? Time is very tight. They live in a Western culture. Life is busy. Inflation is going up. Yada, yada. All the pressures that you're feeling, guess what? I'm feeling them too. But I see the goodness in the people around me. And I feel like, gee, pull up your bootstraps a little bit. 
John, roll up your sleeves a little bit, love a little bit more, offer a little bit more, try and do, try and do something. Okay, what about when I feel like I don't have the resources to do it? Guess what? My answer is the same. Take it to the cross of Christ. Look at Christ on the cross. What resources did he have? He didn't even, we picture him with a loincloth because we're too shy and, and, and uh, modest to picture him naked. But Jesus was crucified naked. Jesus didn't even have underwear. <laughs> like, you know, and you say like, oh, I don't have the resource. I don't, I don't have it in me or I don't have the money or I don't have the time. Or, you know, but you still have your underwear. You know, you're one step ahead of Jesus, right? Jesus on the cross had nothing, nothing. And by the power of God, he did everything, everything. He restored the cosmos. He restored the cosmic order. He, res he restored it all on the cross with nothing but the power of God. And that power of God is available to you and to me. Bring it to Jesus. I hope I didn't scandalize you with that bit about the underwear. Forgive me. I've been told recently I should tone it down a little, but forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me, right? Jesus, Jesus had nothing, had nothing. Go to the one who has nothing. When you're in pain, go to the one who's in pain. Jesus sitting on his throne is really beautiful, right? But maybe a little bit harder to relate to when I'm in pain and he's in heaven, you know, with air conditioning and a pita colada in hand, you know what I mean? And I'm like, and I'm really like, you know, and I'm, and I'm getting, I'm getting squeezed, you know, right? Jesus on his throne is, is wonderful. Go to him on his other throne. Go to him on the throne of the cross where he reigns in love. Go to him there and receive from him the power the power to overcome the fellowship, the companionship to make it through the, the dark tunnel wherever you are. To love the unlovable. Some people, are, some people are easy to love. You get along, you click. That's great, I'm happy for you. Some people less so. That's okay, you're not a bad person if you feel that way. Not everybody's personalities jive. Not, not a problem, that's okay. But I ought to exert the effort to love without partiality. One person comes easy, great. So I can recycle a little bit of that energy towards the one that maybe doesn't come as easily. So that I can love without partiality, treat everybody the same, love everybody the same with the, with the love of Jesus. Service is love in action. There has to be an outflow of your spiritual life. Ask yourself, the, 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 the Bible reading, the prayer, the worship, the focus on God, where is this all going? Where, where does that pour out into? It's got to pour out into something. Either it will pour out into the sharing of the word or it will pour out indeed, indeed in service. God has given us one another so that we can serve one another and love one another indeed. The needs of my brother were given for my sake so that I could serve my brother, so I could have a place to direct the outflow of, of, of love and grace in my life towards, towards somewhere, towards someone. The poor were given to us, to the church, as a gift. Let us not, let us not neglect it. Glory be to God forever.